Hi, I'm Professor Robert Ovetz of College of Marin, and I'm here with Professor Richard Wolf, who's the NASDAQ Distinguished Professor at uh, the New School in New York City. And uh, we're here to talk about the crisis of capitalism. Uh, Richard's just wrapped up a, about an hour and a half marathon talk about the crisis of capitalism at the Occupy Marin uh, 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 meeting uh, just uh, over the last few hours. And uh, we're here to talk about the crisis. When are the causes of the, of the crisis of capitalism? Why do we see now an emergence of the Arab Spring and the Occupy movements around the world, the explosions in Europe? Uh, and where are we going to go once we understand what's caused these crises? So I want to start off uh, uh, asking you a question, uh, Richard. Um, one, of the, one of the things that you've done is, is provided analysis of the erosion of the standard of living of Americans over the last 40 years. Um, starting in the 1970s, in, in many of your speeches in your, uh, that I've heard in your writings, you talk about how uh, a restructuring of, of American capitalism has resulted in a shifting of the wealth out of wages and benefits and uh, into growing indebtedness. And I'm wondering if you could talk about why this explosion of borrowing really took off. What caused it? Um, who was doing the lending? And why do we borrow so much? And what does this have to do with the crisis that we face today? Well, you know, the best way I know to get into this is to talk a moment about the history of the United States. We are a remarkable country in that for most of our history, up until the 1970s, we were a society that raised the wages of its workers on a regular basis, decade after decade, uh, across the 19th century and most of the 20th century, uh, that was true. It brought the waves of immigrants that make up the American people. It uh, brought us a nation that assumed that if you work hard, you do well and you do better as time goes along and your children will do better than you and all that. And there was a reason for it. And that's what's kind of missing in most of our history books. The reason is what economists call a labor shortage. There were never enough people in the United States, partly because of what was done to the native people who were here when the Europeans came. But there was always a shortage. Capitalism was successful. Businesses thrived. But they were always running up against the problem of not enough workers. And you can't run a capitalist business without workers. So the solution found by capitalists, always under these conditions, is to raise wages. It would induce people to come to the United States, particularly from Europe over most of this history. Although American capitalists discovered that no sooner did a worker come here from Italy or Poland or Ireland, but they would then say, if I don't get a rising wage, I'm going to go take land in the West, because the West was cleared. And so you had to pay workers not only to come here, but to stay on the East Coast or to stay where the industries were. And so you had this rising wage. In the 1970s, not to make it too complicated, uh, the labor shortage ended. Uh, and there were simple reasons for this. Number one, the computer revolution. We replaced millions of workers with machines. Instead of having 50 people keeping track of the inventory in a supermarket, you have one guy sitting in an office somewhere in Boise, Idaho, watching a ticker telling you how many rolls of toilet paper or boxes of cereal had been sold, and you knew when to replenish. Um, number two, American corporations, because the wages had risen for 150 years, began to see that they could make much more profits by hiring workers in places in the world where the wages hadn't risen for 150 years. So they began leaving the United States in bigger and bigger waves. So suddenly, between the computer getting rid of jobs and the departure for other parts of the world of American corporations, the demand for workers fell apart. Meanwhile, for all kinds of reasons, American women, partly the women's liberation movement, things like that, starting in the 70s, began moving in to look for paid work. And we had a new wave of immigrants, this time from Latin America. So you put that together, computer and export of jobs, meaning there's less demand, and women and immigrants coming in, more supply, corporations everywhere in America discovered don't need to raise wages anymore. There's no labor shortage for us. And the first thing you learn in business school is if you're an employer and you don't have to raise the wages of your workers, don't do it. That's how you make a better business, a better profit. So starting in the 70s, real wages stopped rising. American workers got the same. The, the stunning statistic that Americans still haven't come to face is for the last 35 years, the amount of wealth you get 
for working per hour. The average American worker gets the same bundle of goods and services for an hour's worth of work today that he or she got in 1978. So that changed American economics. It changed our capitalist system. It meant our working class could not assume what they had come to expect, rising wages to pay for a rising standard of living. So their kids could go to school because they could have a nice private home, they could have a car or maybe two if the wife was working, etc., etc. And the American workers reacted to that in two ways. One, they did much more work. American workers work more hours of paid labor a year than workers in any other country on Earth. But the other thing that you asked about is Americans began to borrow. And we borrowed more excuse me, than any working class had ever borrowed before. We invented the, the credit card basically to put credit into the hands of everybody who hadn't had it before. And it was a way for the American people to postpone coming to terms with the end of rising wages. Instead of rising wages, you could borrow more and more, which the American people did, until they couldn't anymore. You know, if you borrow more and more on a flat wage, it's only a matter of time before there's not enough money coming in to pay the debts, to pay the credit, the interest, and the amortization of the debt. And so in 2007, this house of credit cards fell apart. And we're still living in the crisis because, in a sense, we're coming to terms as a people with how this economy worked. The only other thing I would say, and then urge your, the viewers to grasp, is if over the last 35 years what the worker gets from his or her employer is flat, it is also true that over the last 30 years the productivity of the worker, how much stuff you produce in an hour for your employer to sell, kept going up. And if you have what you give to the employer, your productivity go up each year, but what the employer gives to you is flat, then the difference between those two is profit. That's what a business is in. And that's why the gap between rich and poor has become so extreme in America. The workers went into heavier and heavier debt, and the employers cashed in like never before in American history. One of the things that you've talked about that's really fascinating, and you were just talking about this this afternoon, is that essentially to solve the crisis of capitalism of the 1920s and 30s was that Roosevelt made a deal. And, and we talk about this as the wage productivity deal, that as workers produce more, they get a bigger share of the pie. Right. And part of bringing about that social peace in this time when there was great political instability and uprisings and movements of homeless farmers, women, um, uh, movements of communists and the CIO and so forth was that this wage productivity deal was made. And this wage productivity deal, in, in a way, was kept until right. the 1970s. Um, and what really, uh, the question I want to get at, and this is something that uh, uh, a, a number of people uh, have pointed out, is a breakdown in that wage productivity deal, that in exchange for social peace, uh, workers were willing to work harder, produce more in exchange for higher wages. What ended that? Remember, this is this period is beginning with the end of the 1960s. There are these great political uprisings and movements you talked about. Why then? Why in the 1970s was this deal broken? And and it, also where I'm going with this is what's going to replace it effectively? Well, I think you had already since the Great Depression since this explosion of social welfare legislation, social security, unemployment insurance, public sector jobs created in the 1930s, 40s, even into the 50s, you had the problem that this was paid for in part by taxing corporations and taxing the rich. The tax rates on corporations and the rich were much, much higher in the 40s, 50s, and 60s than they are today. Corporations didn't want to pay those taxes. They had been persuaded to, to keep social peace, as you put it, in the 1930s when people were very angry and there was a big union movement and socialist and communist movements. So they had been persuaded. They didn't want to do it, but that they better do it. But they felt after the war was over that that situation now wasn't so dire, that they didn't have to make that deal, and so they began to undo it. I think they were still held back as late as the 60s and 70s, partly by the threat of the Soviet Union, an other that was out there that kind of 
worried them, that, and it was looking like it was growing. After all, China had been added to the Soviet sphere of influence, then Cuba and things like that. Um, but also they felt that there was still the memory of the Great Depression, and the mass of workers was worried. They didn't want to go back to that, and they would see any effort by business to go in that direction as risky to them. By the 1970s and particularly by the later 70s and into the 80s, you had a self-confidence in the business community. They had waited long enough. They could now roll back something they had never wanted and only accepted because of this special... That seemed gone. The unions were weaker. They had been becoming weaker since the mid-50s. The anti-communist McCarthy period of the 50s had basically wiped out the socialists and they weren't... So the forces that had pushed it on them in the Great Depression were now much, much weaker or non-existent, so now was their chance. And they would elect a Reagan as the symbol of the return of the business community, and they've been in charge really ever since. And they felt that this was what they needed to improve their profitability and what they could now have the strength to impose on the American economy. And, you know, it worked real well for 20, 30 years. They just kept pushing, and has happened so often before, they pushed too far. And now they're beginning to get the, the pushback. And I see a lot of parallels. A lot of people talk about the parallels with the Great Depression. I actually think the parallels go further back to the teens and the 20s, when we also had a massive movement of wobblies and Eugene Debs' Socialist Party that was winning over a million votes. Um, we had the emergence of industrial unionism that was challenging the conservative American Federation of Labor. Um, and when the U.S. went into World War I, there was a, a crackdown. The Palmer Raids, for example, um, strikes were banned, court injunctions were issued, breaking strikes and arresting strike leaders. Um, and there were no legal recognitions of unions or of working people or even the right to dissent. The First Amendment hadn't really been tested even at that point. So by the time the economy collapses yet again in 1929, um, there's no legal infrastructure for allowing self-organization of people, allowing dissent to happen. And so one thing that comes out of that period is a legalization of unions with the Wagner Act and as you've been talking about the Social Security Act and unemployment and so forth. And now that's being dismantled, little by little, death by a thousand cuts. Do you think we're heading back to the same kind of situation where all of those pieces of that social peace deal, now that they're being attacked and dismantled, Social Security being attacked by cutting the payroll contributions, they call it a tax, it's not really a tax, um, the, uh, the bans on collective bargaining and, and, and so forth. Do you think we're heading back to the situation where um, the, the mechanisms for peaceful change are, uh, are being suppressed? Absolutely. I think that's what I meant before. The business community, having gotten its way uh, for the last 25 years, has kind of convinced itself that there really is no limit. They can keep going and they keep going. I'll give you an example. Over the last 12 months, basically over the year 2011, the real wage of the American working class has dropped by 2%. Every economist, left, right, and center, will tell you that one of the basic problems of the American economy is there's not enough purchasing power to buy goods and services to keep people working. The thing you do in that circumstance is to give the mass of people greater purchasing power. We just spent the last year depriving our working class so it has 2% less to spend. And that's craziness, but it's a sign that the business community wants to use unemployment as a chance to lower wages, and there's no counterforce. The unions are neither capable nor willing to mount a movement against it. And the irony is, and this is something that the critics of capitalism have often said, the irony is that the capitalist system has its own momentum where it becomes self-destructive. It, it pushes so far and doesn't understand its own limits. You know, it's an old criticism of capitalism that if capitalists are successful in pressing down the wages of their workers to get more profits, 
They're forgetting that in order to get profits, you not only have to get a lot of work out of your worker, but you have to be able to sell what that worker produces for you. And that means you got to sell a lot of that back to those workers. But if you've cut their wages, they can't buy it. So what you gain in your profits by lowering wages, you lose by not having enough customers. You have to work that out somehow. They're not in a mood to work anything out. In order to work that out, there has to be some sort of organized institution that can present grievances, right? right? And now that we're and seeing... Enforce it, enforce higher wages. And enforce it, exactly. But now that we're seeing a, a kind of interconnection of national security and the war on terrorism with the way to respond with overwhelming militarized responses to the Occupy movement, for example, lacking, of course, for the Tea Party movement, um, in, and the unions being much too closely aligned as an auxiliary of the Democratic Party and not willing to challenge the kind of austerity and privatization movements of the Democrats, in some ways, aren't we in, opening it up for uh, in, increasing escalation of conflict in order to, to be heard? Do, do well, you see down the road in 1960s perhaps emerging or 1930s when workers were taking over factories and farmers were burning their crops or in the 60s when the black community and Puerto Rican community were, were arming themselves? Yeah, I think that'll be part of the scenario. I think we will also see the building up of new organizations to replace the absent organizations that are not there. When you push people as much as we're pushing them, in a sense, that's what Occupy is. It's the first beginnings of an organized way of voicing these grievances, saying that the system isn't working, beginning to explore real alternatives, beginning to push for them. So I think we'll have all of these different things. I think it, much is in the hands of the authorities. If they respond the way they did to Occupy, by doing nothing for two months and then deciding that the solution is basically to commit violence against these groups. Uh, and that's really what we had. There was no violence committed by the people in Zuccotti Park in New York City. The violence begins when the mayor of New York orders bulldozers and police to go in and arrest people and destroy the, the little public library. Their they property, had set up. their own property. Yeah, necessary. destroy what these people had brought there, this is an admission of failure. You got no plan, you got no program, you don't respond to the issues these people have raised, you repress them. And you know, in the short run, there's no Occupy occupation in Zuccotti Park at night. By the way, it's there during the daytime. But you've taught everybody a lesson that this is what you can expect from the government, and that lesson is going to be learned. The presumption of the repressors, that repression is the solution, we, we as a nation celebrate that that doesn't work in Egypt, it doesn't work in Tunisia, it doesn't work in Bahrain, it doesn't work now in Syria, and we congratulate those people. The same leaders have nothing to say about that in the United States. They watch repression and they say nothing. No one misses this. No one misses that in New York City, Mayor uh, Bloomberg uh, plowed under the little private library set up by these people under their own time and energy while he's cutting library hours in the public libraries of New York City. The irony there is not lost on anyone. Same thing in Oakland as well. Yeah. Um, they're actually shutting down libraries. Um, so in, in some ways it ties in with what you were talking about earlier that there's no democracy in the workplace. In fact, many people observe that our constitution ends when you go to work, right? right. And so now we're starting to see that there, the, the institutions of democracy are not working to allow people to feel like they can peacefully address their grievances uh, about these things that are happening. Now basically, large corporations undid the New Deal. They undid all that legislation. They're in the process now of cutting back Social Security, as you mentioned. You know, as long as we leave the basic resources, economic wealth, in the hands of a tiny number of corporations, mega corporations, whose boards of directors and major shareholders call the tune, they will, of course, use the money to control politics. They will use the money in all these ways. And, you know, if we permit that, if we permit all the resources that we, the mass of people, actually produce to be concentrated in the hands of people who use it in this clearly anti-social way in terms of the mass of people, then in a sense we have only ourselves to blame that we haven't interceded in a situation that is not tolerable. One thing that you take pride in is, is 
identifying yourself as using what we call a class analysis, that, you're, um, that you have studied Marxism and you use the tools that Marx left us, not as a sociologist or as a, as a political economist, in fact, he critiqued political economists, but to use those tools to understand what's happening in, a, in our capitalist society and to try to change it. And, and I wonder if you might talk a little bit about um, somebody who's been getting also a lot of attention for his use of class analysis, David Harvey. Um, and David Harvey has essentially been making a critique that what we've seen in the last 40 years is a, is a form of neoliberalism. That uh, in, in, the sh in really in brief that Harvey's saying that in the last 40 years what we've seen is a, a sh the use of tools of privatization and austerity and cutbacks um, and uh, a reduction of those democratic uh, tools of grievance presenting um, in order to shift power. Um, what do you think about this analysis that understanding what happened in the last 40 years is about a shift in power, that the power that organized people were able to use to get a better deal or a larger share of the pie or whatever you want to put it in Social Security and these things we've been talking about. What do you think about that perspective? Is there any, is there any value in understanding this as a, as a, as a, a class struggle, if you will, over power? Yes, I, I certainly agree with David Harvey uh, that class is a central issue here. I guess where I would disagree a little bit is in the primacy he and others give to this question of the power. For me, it's an important part of the story, but A, it's only a part, and B, I think you understand the struggle over power, who has what power, as a outgrowth, as coming from the more fundamental, for me, uh, issue of the economic organization, how production is, is done. Um, corporations have power because they receive into their hands the wealth of our society. You know, when you go to work, you produce goods and services from 9 to 5. At the end of the day, at 5 o'clock, you go home. The stuff you produce stays back. It's automatically the property of somebody else. You poured your muscle power into it. You poured your brain power. You made whatever it is, the software program, the hamburger, the haircut, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, you go home, and if you take any of that with you, you get punished. You have to learn, like a child in a, in a kindergarten, that's not yours. You may have produced it. You may have poured yourself into it. But it belongs to somebody else, and you have to leave it. And you leave in the hands of a corporation, which is a tiny group of people compared to those who do the work, all the discretion about what to do with it. If they give themselves a lot of that wealth as personal income, which they do, if they pay their top executives fabulous income, which they do, then it becomes clear that to hold on to the benefits to them of this organization of economic life, they have to control politics. Because after all, what is American politics? We all go to vote. We all have a vote. It is possible that the mass of people looking at an economic system as undemocratic as this one, as beneficial to such a small number of people, will come to the idea, let's use our political power to undo what is hurting us economically. The people who run the economic system, who get the benefit of all this, they're not stupid. They see that too. They better do something to neutralize the potential power people have politically. And the way they've done that is to use the wealth they get, the profits of their business, to control politics, to take over, as you put it, all the levers of power that they can, to make the parties dependent on their money, to make the candidates dependent on their contribution, and to make the public discussion dependent on what countless think tanks and public relations enterprises do to shape the discourse. Who gets heard, who doesn't? Who gets published, who doesn't? And all of that. And they work very hard to capture the levers of power, but it's in the interest of reproducing an economic system that is benefiting them at the expense of everybody else. And I don't think that's going to be hard for the mass of people to figure out. And they're going to realize, uh-oh, we don't just have to contest about the power. We have to do something about the economic institutions out of which this power problem occurs to us. So, one so thing for me, in a sense, let me just conclude, sure. the class issue goes at the core to the organization of production. 
You can't continue to have the mass of people producing a profit in the hands of a tiny group of people because they'll continue to use that in the ways that disadvantage the mass of people. If you don't change that, even if you were able to conduct a political struggle, and even if you were able to win it the way the, the, way the mass of people were in the Great Depression, by creating social security, unemployment insurance, and federal jobs programs, then the institutions of private enterprise will undo it once you're done and you're back to square one. You have to learn the lesson. So we're seeing essentially a new cycle of movements spreading around the world. Right. Um, was really started in the 1990s in, in Latin America and swept through Asia and, and, um, and Europe and the Middle East, and now it's come to the United States. In the last few minutes that we have, how can we take this as an opportunity to address those very issues of who owns, who runs the economy, who makes the decisions? Some of the things you've talked about is essentially democratic control of, of yeah. work by workers. Right. How, do we, how do we use this as an opportunity to, to, to broach this issue and, and actually make those kinds of changes that we need, a kind of future in the present, as C.L.R. Tim's called it? I think that we have to face what the enormity of our task is. We have to undo the institutions that govern our economic system, private enterprise, corporate, all of those have to be made subject to criticism, subject to debate. We have to explore the alternatives, namely workers running their own enterprises. Those have to be put on the table. We have to demand the rights and the supports for those kinds of enterprises to get off the ground so people can see what it's like to work in an enterprise where you're not told what to do by an undemocratic leadership at the top, et cetera, et cetera. We have to be open to do that. I think the mass of the American people are very interested that the failure, excuse me, the failure of the capitalist system for them and for their children is palpable. It, and it, we will find ourselves able to build new organizations, to learn from the old ones so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Uh, that is, don't do what they did that didn't work, but do do what they did that did work. Let's remember, whatever our criticisms of the CIO, the socialists, and the communists, they were able to get things done for the mass of people in the 1930s that we have not yet replicated. We miss their absence, and we have to form new organizations and that's only done when people get together and are determined to do it. And the American people have the, the desire, they have the skills, they have the tools. One of the big stories that's been missing about the Occupy movement that's fascinating for me, and I actually brought my daughter to see this in Oakland, was that it's not just a protest. It's actually constructing what a society in which takes care of all the needs, not just the, the, the Maslow types of hierarchy of needs of food and shelter, but also the other needs of setting up libraries, of having a kind of uh, university in the open. Um, in what ways is the Occupy movement uh, such a threat because it does that, because it, it gives us a glimpse of what our future could be like? Yes, and I think it gives us mostly the glimpse that when people share a critical perspective and get together, there's almost no limit to what they can do. I mean, the Occupy movement is an absolute phenomenon. It begins in September, and by November, it is the number one news story across this country in which perspectives that have been marginalized become part of the mainstream, in which everybody thinks in terms of 1% versus 99%. These are perspectives that were marginal at best a few months earlier and become mainstream literally overnight. Whatever you think about the power of the Occupy movement, that tells you that the soil is very fertile, that the interest of masses of people, even those who disagree, is captured by the way this movement responds to what is happening. The biggest organizer of the left has always been a capitalism that doesn't function and doesn't know how to fix itself. Well, thank been you very pleasure much. talking to you. It's great to hear you in person, and I'm sure I'll be hearing a lot more from you. I hope so, and it's a great time to be active and to believe in change in the United States. I think you're our Joe Hill of the, <laughs> of the new millennium. Thanks. Thank you.